Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Welcome into another edition of the JMU Sports News Podcast. I'm Bennett Conlon. I'm joined by Jack Fitzpatrick. Jack, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Second time we've talked today, and I just can't get enough. (laughs) Of me? (laughs) No, of Harry O'Kelly. Okay, yeah. Well, we have a very special guest. It's Harry O'Kelly. Cats out of the bag. Cats out of the bag. As you just said. Uh, Really fun interview with him. Obviously, not all that, like, detailed or groundbreaking, but... Um, just a lot of fun with a very fun player and kind of talked to him about his JMU career, how he came to JMU, which is not like a, a secret, but something that I think maybe people forgot because it was probably more um, more thoroughly reported in like 2017 when he was a freshman, right, um, compared to 2022 now. So it's been a while. So we did a little refresher there, talked to him about, about being a specialist. We talked to him, I guess the breaking stuff, we kind of got to the bottom of, of the early career, lots of fake punt. Yep. And then uh, why that wasn't as as common or common at all toward the end of his career. And then we also talked to him briefly about uh, next steps and what could be a really impressive pro day from him, I think. Yeah, he did give us a little bit of insight into what he's been doing to prepare for his pro day. Um, and I'm really excited to see his 40 time when it comes out, because it sounds like he's been really working hard to get that up. Or yeah, down, physically, physically, he looked he had to get it up. He's trying to run like a six or seven second forty. <laughs> no, <laughs> physically, man, I think some of the some of the numbers he's aiming for are, are wildly impressive. So we'll see what happens there. But great to have him on. He's always a, a fun person to interact with and communicate with. So I enjoyed that one. I guess we should just uh, lead off with the the best that we have, right? Kick it to Harry. Yeah, we. Uh, this is our. I was trying to think of a baseball analogy, but I couldn't find one off the top of my head that quick. So take it away. Harry O'Kelly, Bennett, and Jack in the past. Thank you for tuning in to the JMU Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the college bowls and the pro football playoffs begin. Bet online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code believe that's promo code believe B L E A V to receive that bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available this season. Bet online is the safest, easiest and fastest way to bet all your favorite sports don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing new offers available bet online where the game starts we have a very special guest on this week's podcast harry o'kelly who is known for his punting and maybe maybe more known for his fake punting uh, which is kind of how jmu fans came to love harry so harry how are you today I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm uh, happy to be here. <laughs> we're excited to have you, and I think we'll we'll start, I guess, with we were talking about this beforehand. Your quote unquote origin story, which makes you seem like a villain. So I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but I guess how did you end up coming to JMU? I think fans have read about it a little bit, but it's still interesting to have you know someone who played Australian rules football, I believe, growing up uh, in Australia, to then come to to Harrisonburg and find himself as a hunter for quite a few years. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, so I you know grew up playing Australian rules football, uh, which is not rugby. Um, that's a shock to a lot of people that <laughs> you know come up to me. So you played rugby, no? But I played Australian rules football. Finished high school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. But my cousin had a mate that played American football for Ole Miss, and I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, how did he get there? And he said, oh, he told me about this program down in Melbourne called Pro Kick Australia. Uh, led by Nathan Chapman and John Smith. So I thought, you know, I don't don't know what I want to study. So I like sports. I might as well give it a crack. Moved down to Melbourne, bartended at night and learned how to punt during the day. And about a year later, uh, Coach Houston came calling. He got in contact with uh, Chappie and 
sent in my film and I think I was in Harrisonburg that summer. Uh, so about two months later, I was in Harrisonburg doing summer workouts with uh, Big John. Wow. <laughs> Quite the, the time frame and the process there. Can you take us through the differences, I guess, between American football and, and the rules in Australian football and, and maybe even rugby and how that kind of differs? Yeah, so Australian football, it's, uh, it's played on a big oval. It's about two to three times the size of American football when you run about 13 miles, 12 miles a game. So I like to run. Um, <laughs> growing up playing a sport where I have to run all the time. So that's a big difference coming over here and, you know, just kind of watching everyone else be the athletes <laughs> and you kind of just go on the field and clean up the mess a little bit when you can. Um, so that's ultimately what led me to running my first fake. I was like, I can make that first down marker. And there's pretty strong wind in my face, so I might just hold on to this one. Um, so, yeah, in Australian rules football, you predominantly kick the ball. Uh, that's how you pass it. So it would be like a bunch of quarterbacks with feet running around the field, um, trying to hit people on, on routes, I guess. And uh, you have to bounce the ball when you run, and you can also hand pass it, uh, just like kind of hit the ball like that to each other. But it's predominantly kicking, and you kick the ball through the goalpost for a goal. So that first time you had ran a fake punt, was it called or did you just catch it and think I can make that? No. So um, we're at Delaware and the wind was like so strong. I just kicked a, maybe a 30 yarder that rolled backwards and I'm probably being generous myself with that, how, how far <laughs> that one went. And um, we're up 13, 10 and my heels are on my four yard line. And I don't still don't really know the sport that well and how ridiculous it sounds now. But uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, if there's an edge there, if my shield member gets the edge, I'm just going to uh, go to the first down mark. I don't want to kick into this wind again. And um, we'll <laughs> give them the ball on their own 40 going in. We're only up three. So ran, made it. Uh, I think Coach Houston said I wouldn't have played for him again if I didn't make that. So um, <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, but, you know, it all worked out well. We held the ball for the rest of that quarter and I think missed a field goal at the end of the quarter. But um, then we had the win in the last quarter and we ran away with it, I think. That's awesome. I think Jack and I were talking about this before you hopped on, but we were kind of curious because you ran, I think, three successful fake punts your freshman year, which is a lot of fake punts, That's absurd. <laughs> especially to have no them. One, it's absurd <laughs> that no one gained – like they didn't just put someone on the edge at one point. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then I, yeah, it was fascinating too because I think the North Dakota State one you went left, where I think previously you'd gone right on the two fake punts. But it was it was really fascinating with that. And we were kind of curious. Obviously, I guess the last three years maybe they didn't even attempt one. I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. We it's just uh, with Coach Houston staff, I had the green light. I was allowed to, especially after that first one. They said um, if it's there, you can go. So. Uh, I had three my freshman year and then uh, one, I think, my sophomore year. Um, mm -hmm. One or I know the Colgate one, that was that was cold. <laughs> Just put it out there. I didn't want to run that <laughs> on myself. That one was cold. <laughs> um, so, and then, yeah, the, the next coaching staff, uh, just weren't as comfortable with it and that's fine. I'm there to be a punter, so I punted the ball every time we had one called one against William and Mary uh, didn't work. That was more kind of just to stop teams from overloading us on the right side so much. Gotcha. That's, that's really interesting with all that. Yeah. So I guess like the North Dakota state one in the national championship was that, is that one called? Is that you feeling it and going left? I guess, how's that one work? That one was, uh, we'd worked on that one mm -hmm. uh, leading up to Frisco because uh, all the fakes had been right and they were trying to overload the right side a lot in games prior. So uh, we spoke about it and then running just before we ran out into the field, coach Houston was like, if it's there, do it. So we ran out there and we got the look we liked. So we, um, we did it and it was fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if it was like, there was a few uh, blocks that could have been, if it was schemed up exactly right and we ran it exactly the way we should have it probably could have ended up in the end zone. Um, but you know, we got the first down, which was 
big in the game and I ran off like we were going to win, but you know, it didn't <laughs> happen. And that's sports though. So. Did, did you ever like go to Signetti during his tenure, his three years while you were there and petition to, to get a couple more fakes <laughs> run or, or were you more, were you accepting of it and said, okay, I'll just, I'll just do my punts and I won't push it too hard. I was pretty accepting. I mean, we had lights out offense uh, and a lights out defense. So, you know, uh, I think, I guess we did as well in 17, 18, but. Um, <laughs> We're going to clip this and send it to the 17 and 18 team and make sure that they hear uh, that you said yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm part of that team as well. So, <laughs> um, but no, not really. Um, you know, we, we, we always speak about uh, things we can run and try and scheme up teams, but I never really asked for the, the green light from coach Signetti himself. I maybe brought it up with the special teams coordinator, but it's just, we didn't really need to do it, I guess. Um, so I just, and I was fine with punting. That's, you know, like I said, that's what I was there to ultimately do. That makes a ton of sense. Just generally speaking, you mentioned sort of Australian rules football and how much you would run during a game. What was it like to kind of sit on the bench, especially you've got, you know, five years in Harrisonburg with, really good offenses i mean the punting wasn't necessarily needed all the time what's it like to to spend a lot of time just sitting oh it's i mean i'd much rather do it for a team you know watching them win every week (laughs) but uh it's it was frustrating a little bit i miss australian rules football because i you know i like to uh like tackle and run and get hit and you know feel the pressure be really in the moment of the game um so that's something i missed but um you know, that's why when I ran fakes, I didn't run out of bounds except for the first one because I just was running for that marker. But I, I wanted to try and I wanted to get hit, get tackled from the ball. So I missed that part of it. Yeah, I can I can see how that'd be something you would <laughs> definitely miss and have to adjust to. I was interested, too, because Jack and I. Uh, on a different podcast, we're talking to a, a long snapper who used to play at, at Iowa, and he had mentioned that it's kind of like unique being a specialist on a team and kind of how you, you're doing different things and all that stuff. What's it like to practice as a specialist? Do you still feel, I guess, fully integrated on the team? I know fans certainly loved you, but I guess how did it feel to, to have such a unique role on the team? Yeah, I think uh, we, do, we have a very good culture at JMU where everyone's appreciated. Um, and then – the all the specialists were, were, were i mean we had ethan unbelievable kicker and tyler <laughs> before that and uh kyle davis is a really good long snapper and um i did my job i guess <laughs> most of the time <laughs> except for a few but um so they appreciated what we do and we appreciate what they do um and i guess there's just a level of respect for each other um at practice you know it, it can get boring for us we uh spend a lot of time just talking uh you know if offense makes a play i'm ripping on the defense if defense makes a play i'm (laughs) on the offense uh so we're kind of part of it in that sense and then when we go out for the five minutes we're actually doing something uh it's kind of it's fun we get to go out and do our thing and show them that we're not just standing there the whole time throughout your career what was your favorite i don't know if you have a favorite punt i don't know if they if there's one that sticks out in your mind either maybe for good or bad, but is there one that just you always, you, you go back to and think about? Yeah. Um, there's a few that I've been pretty happy with. Um, I've, I've got like favorite games, like the Northern Iowa. I was, I was able to pin them deep uh, majority of the game, which was good. Uh, but my favorite pun I think was against Maine in my freshman year. And it was like a, going in punt and hit the one yard line and bounce back straight to the long snapper. Uh, that was pretty cool. It was a bit of a welcome to uh, football. Uh, it gave me a nice kind bounce and I was pretty happy with that one. So, and then obviously there's the ones you kick really far, but I'd rather pin a team deep than kick one really far. It's a better feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. What was it like to kind of have the, uh, the fans love you as much as they did and support you as much as, as they did. Was it surprising at all? And then what's it like the last few years when, when you weren't faking punts, did you have fans in your mentions kind of clamoring to <laughs> have you run one? What was that like? 
no, it's all fun. And I, I love the, the fan engagement. I think, um, you know, I'm not during the games. I, I don't really mind, you know, I, most of the players are pretty locked in and not going to think about what's going on. And I don't really mind, you know, giving a smile and a, how's it going, talk to them a little bit, respond to what they're yelling. That's just my way of being locked in. I'd like to feel the game and feel everyone a part of it. And, you know, I, my mentions did stack up a lot on Twitter, like, when are you going to run? <laughs> but it, I, I want to reply like, soon. It's happening. It's going to come soon. But, you know, it never did. But um, <laughs> I love the fan engagement. The, we've just got such a good fan base as well. So I wanted to show them appreciation by letting them know they're heard. That would have uh, that would have been good if you had teased the the fake punts and never actually ran one. Just give <laughs> people every week they're <laughs> waiting for it. For the fans, uh, for the fans in the in the sections close to me, I'd always say it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think after this podcast, there's going to be a just a group of Jamie fans with pitchforks at Signetti's office, wondering why <laughs> we're not <laughs> more willing to run the fakes. Uh, it happens. Maybe maybe we'll get some in the next few years. <laughs> yeah for sure and what's uh i was curious too just the pro kick australia and and i guess those uh different people you've met through that what's kind of like the australia to usa punter pipeline relationships like do you know other guys who are also australian guys who have come to the u.s played college football and, and what are those relationships like yeah some of my best mates uh came through the program so uh oscar bradburn punted at virginia tech uh just up the road down the road whatever it is. Um, my mate Kirk, he punted a pit and then a bunch of other mates as well. Uh, we all keep in contact on, you know, Facebook group messages and stuff. And I'm always checking stats to see how they punted. And even last Christmas when COVID hit, um, we about 10, 12 of us went down to Fort Lauderdale and said we wanted to have a warm summer, warm, warm Christmas because that's what it is in Australia. So we went down there and got an Airbnb. And I think that's, been huge to have when we come over to have this network base and even Richmond got a punter and you know I try to tell him don't send one to Richmond but poor guy <laughs> anyway he um he got here in the summer and I went down and uh spent went out with him and went to a few bars and introduced him to my friends who live in Richmond before he kind of knew everyone um so it's a good connection to have and even though I never met him prior to that it's just to, for him to know that, you know, we all, we're all here for each other. And my little brother's down at Texas state and he's got mates around him. Um, so it, it's, it's a really good program and it helps knowing people here as well. And if you ever want to go to a, a game, you just, do they have a pro kick kid? Yes. Then sweet. Just send him a message. I think some of my mates on the baseball team wanted to go to the, the whiteout game, Penn state versus Auburn. Yeah. And they couldn't get tickets. So I said, I'll message the Auburn punter. Never met him, <laughs> but he said, yeah, sure. I got us four family tickets. So <laughs> it's really funny. cool. What, what is it about that pipeline from Australia to punting in college? And I mean, slowly but surely they're starting to get into the NFL now too. But what is it about that pipeline that is making it so like, it's just booming in popularity. It seems like. Yeah. I think it's just, we grow up as kids playing kick to kick, not throwing anything. So when you have guys coming over and a lot of kids over here don't want to be punters or kickers, you know, it's usually the kids that play soccer that maybe the high school coach is like, come over here and have a go. Like Racky, for instance, he grew up playing soccer and the high school coach gave him a shot on the football team and look where it took him. We grow up our whole lives playing a sport. We kick in the ball. So it's just an easy transition. Um, over to being a punter and then in college especially you can do the rollout which is what I did and that's uh what we grow up doing so you can't do that in the NFL so the guys with the strongest legs um who still grew up kicking their whole lives but they're much better at doing the spiral kick uh they get their shots at the NFL as well awesome that makes a ton of sense I think everyone's curious. I know, I know we are kind of what your, your future plans are now that you, I guess, won't be a part of the JMU football program in terms of the, the active roster. I, fans will remember you for a while for sure, but what's next on your plate? Um, so I'm just, I've got my visa approved to stay uh, in the States and work over here. I'm going to try and uh, I've been doing a bunch of interviewing at the moment. Uh, it's really handy having the 
JMU network and I've uh, leaned on that a lot. Um, and that's why I tried to be such a people's person while I've been here. Cause I know that uh, down the line, it's going to help a lot. Uh, so I'm in that process right now. I'm uh, I'll, I'll probably do pro day. Uh, I don't think my leg's quite strong enough for the league, but you know, why not give it a crack? Um, run the 40 yard dash and then leave. <laughs> See if I can get a look there. <laughs> but, Maybe uh, if it was COVID times, you could clock in like a three, two, like we were seeing some, uh, some people <laughs> yeah. clocking in. Yeah. Really I think my, I, COVID. I think I might just send in my, my, uh, stats. I'll just say, yeah, 40, four, two, um, vertical was like, I don't even know, 40, um, <laughs> Bench press, 225. I was about 18. <laughs> I'll just send them in. I love that. Yeah, just submit it. Maybe have like a, a fake video you put together or something that <laughs> does it too. Yeah, I'll get uh, Chris Thornton to run and then I'll say it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just give him your jersey or something. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. That's cool to hear that you'll be staying in the States. And uh, I guess if you're near Harrisonburg, you can always stop by and uh, – make Signetti give you I feel like they owe you like tickets for a while after after not being as open with the fake punt right exactly I think I'm I'm definitely guaranteed a few tickets I'll I'll uh I'll be I'll be at all the games probably if I'm around this area just awesome. jump around the tailgates it's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> good just to get free beer just walk around <laughs> yeah exactly all the lots. Yeah. I think there are uh, you're one of the few punters in the country who can definitely get free beer at pretty much any any tailgate at their home school. I'll we'll see what I can do. <laughs> Love to hear that. Awesome, Jack. You got anything else? No, I'm all good. Awesome. Well, Harry, thanks so much for for joining us, and good luck with all the future endeavors, including that uh, highly anticipated 40 yard dash. Yeah, thanks heaps, guys. I really appreciate you both having me on. I'm uh looking forward to seeing what happens with the, the football team next year and their transition. And um, hopefully I'll guys at a couple of the games. For sure. Sweet as. Thank you so much to Harry O'Kelly for taking the time out of his day. That was a good about 20 minute conversation just about his life. Um, and I do want to say to all JMU fans, Bennett alluded to it in the interview please don't break, take fit pitchforks to Kurt Signetti's office. Um, that's just his coaching style. We don't, need to, we don't need to attack him for not letting Harry O'Kelly be the number one running back. Yeah, I think it kind of made sense to, to punt a lot, right, with your punter. I think Harry understood that, and it made a ton of sense um, where maybe you aren't trying to run a bunch of fakes. Would have been fun if they gave him the green light because I think he might have taken it a couple of times, but still, still a very productive career. He's one of the best punters in the country, really. Um, before we dive into the talk of all the transfers and uh, Todd, Todd Centeo, um, we just yes. looked up the pronunciation, so hopefully we're doing that one correctly. Before we talk about all that and Antoine Wells leaving, I do want to say I didn't know that – what was that face? I was frowning because Antoine Wells oh. was leaving. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. Um, and Harry O'Kelly is now leaving, so two of the best players to ever grace the uh, field for JMU won't be playing next season. However – I love the story that he told about the very first fake punt that he ran. The fact that it wasn't caught. Can we just talk about this really quick? The fact that he was on his own four yard line and said, as a freshman, I'm going to run for this. Was he on his own four? Was that, that's what he said. He said Did his he? heels were on his four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I missed that part, but uh, no, I mean, pretty wild that he just kind of, he trusted it and I guess sort of had maybe a semi green light. I do kind of remember that game looking back. I think that was the game and I'm double checking here. That was, yeah, that was a real grind of a game that yeah. was in, in Newark. Yes. And it like, I guess the temperature they're claiming it was 62 that day. It didn't really feel like that. Um, maybe that was a kickoff and it must've gotten a lot colder, but it was pretty windy late September. It's where Andrew Ankara had that defensive touchdown. It was a 20 to 10 kind of a slog and, Harry O'Kelly kind of had it had it right where where Jamie sort of pulled away late from what was a competitive game. So, yeah, I mean, just a, a heck of a play by him, and uh, really cool that they were able to to utilize his athleticism, which most punters don't seem to have that like speed and, and background that he has, where he was yeah. playing a sport that I don't realize you would run like twelve to thirteen miles per game throughout like an Australian rules football game. Yeah, he was explaining it. It sounded like it was a mix of soccer and football and basketball. Like he was saying you have to bounce the ball when you're running it. Like 
what is that? Sp- now I need to go and find how I can bet on this sport and how I can stream it at night. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> it sounds pretty cool. But it was it was really cool to hear him talk about that and and his journey at JMU and and kind of you know what he was able to accomplish and all that. So I'm double checking some of what he said because I think it'll be funny. Um, I'm trying to find where the fake punt comes in the. I was gonna say, what are you re- like if through a podcast well, where it is in the in the game it. log, but I can't even find it. Was it the it's second quarter or the third quarter? He said the third quarter. Ah, that's what I was looking incorrectly. Yeah, yes, his feet probably were there because they were at the <laughs> they had a false start, so they had the ball at the eighteen. He's probably way back there, and he took it, ran for nine yards, um, and then I guess after, <laughs> apparently after D'Angelo Amos had a personal foul. So it backed them up, but they still got the first down. It must have been after the play. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. That's kind of hilarious. Uh, the other thing, he had mentioned some of his, like, short punts uh, before he ran the fake. He had one in the first half that was, like, 21 yards. Like, the wind was really howling. So Yeah, he said he went. He said it went 30 yards, and then it bounced, bounced back. back. So, <laughs> yeah. Seems like he's got a pretty good memory of that one. I also loved when he was telling us about his punt freshman year against Maine. Like, what's your yep. favorite punt? He was like, 2017. <laughs> Landon, <laughs> that he remembered that. I thought was pretty funny. Athletes are so funny with, like, what they remember. Like, if you asked me, like, a specific memory from a game, I probably could not tell you, even though I right. my job was literally to watch the games. Um, and then athletes, on the other hand, they're like, yeah, with 414 left in the third quarter, they uh, re- like Cooper Cup explaining like a defensive look. Yeah. And he's like the too high safety. They rovered over and you're just like, what the F are you saying? Athletes yeah. are interesting. Sean McVay being able to t- recite an entire game back to you play by play perfectly. It's all just an amazing thing. And well, you know what else is an amazing thing? COVID vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> no, all the transfers. Well, so I don't know. I mean, that's, I think there are a lot of people who disagree with that. <laughs> well, I'm, tr- I'm trying to focus on the positive here in the new year. I'm trying to be a positive person, right. have that positive outlook. And I'm looking at it at Todd Sinteo. Sin- yeah. um, eventually I'll be able to say that without <laughs> reading the pronunciation guide on how to say it. Um, he's coming to JMU, a prolific passer at Colorado State in the Mountain West. Um, but we did lose Antoine Wells Jr. Yeah, I guess I guess we can talk about it all kind of at once. We'll we'll go and do uh, Centeo, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, he threw for 15 touchdowns this past year. 16. I'm seeing 15, but I guess 16. Sports Reference says 15. Actually, no. It, yeah, it says 15. Unless I think his career at Colorado State he threw 16. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. My apologies. Yeah. yeah excuse you. <laughs> so he, <laughs> <laughs> he had 15 this year. He also had 10 interceptions, but he had uh, almost 3,000 yards, and he runs the ball really well. He ran for 439 yards, made some plays there. So he can run. He's a dual-threat guy. I think the thing that excites me is that, like, yeah, he threw some interceptions this previous year at Colorado State. Um, I wasn't impressed with that Colorado State coaching staff. Like, they have Steve Adazio, if I'm not mistaken. Like, I don't think that's all that great a coaching staff. I don't think Adazio is a particularly good coach. Um, so for him to put up those numbers in that offense with what we've seen, Signetti, uh, Tino Sinceri, you know, yep. that, that group of guys, what is it? Um, Shanahan, the offensive coordinator now, uh, I Shanahan. think there's, yeah. So I think there's a good Kyle doesn't come in on Saturdays, that'd be cool. <laughs> but yeah, Mike Shanahan, I did forget his first name. So thank you, Mike Shanahan. Cause I, uh, I was thinking Shane Montgomery, but he's not there, but they have a really good group of coaches, essentially the point I'm trying to make. So I think, for him to join this coaching staff with like the physical abilities that he has. I think it's a really good move. Um, I kind of like it more than Gunnar Holmberg, who was going to probably oh, be I like the it so much better than Gunnar Holmberg. I was not, when I saw Gunnar Holmberg, I thought Billy Atkins had a very good chance to still beat him out. I mean, this, this, this coaching staff has showed that no matter who comes in from a transfer like perspective, the incumbent QB or I guess not the incumbent QB, but the QBs on the roster are going to get a chance to, to really fight and really compete for that starting job. So it's by no means given that Todd Santeo is going to start week one. I mean, he probably is, but with, if Gunnar Holmberg came in, I would have given the edge to Billy Atkins, but here I give it to Todd. 
Yeah, I think Zentejo is probably the leader in the clubhouse, but I really like Billy Atkins. And I also thought the fact that Billy Atkins went from like fourth string to backup over like his freshman year, two weeks of fall camp was rather impressive. So he's clearly got some ability. I think the experience, of course, gives the edge a little bit there to Zentejo, who I think at the very least they now have like quarterback depth. Is um the freshman Alfonso Barrett, I believe his name is? It was Alonzo. Alonzo, Alonzo Barrett. Is he coming in this year, do you know? Is he going to be in fall camp? Check. This is really good podcasting. This is great podcasting because I believe Maybe it's – It might be Barnett. What did I say, Barrett? Yeah, it's Alonzo oh, Barnett. I just messed up his name royally on every single front. Or Alonza, Alonza. Sorry, two A's. Alonza Barnett. He's a North Carolina kid, class of 2022. So I imagine he would be coming – in fall in the fall or, or spring or whatever i forget exactly when he was coming but yeah he's another really good athlete so i, I feel pretty good about the quarterback room yeah it well, was a weak spot coming into this offseason i think has been bolstered very quickly and is, is kind of a stronger point however they're not going to be throwing to one of the most prolific receivers in fcs antoine wells announced he's transferring and within 45 minutes had power five offers out the wazoo which makes you think was there a little bit of a, a little bit of recruiting going on before he entered the transfer portal. Yes, and <laughs> four four minutes ago, the Dukes have added a Boston College receiver transfer. So uh, and the a portal Mon- is and active, they, and they added a Monmouth transfer yesterday, wide receiver. And apparently, they have in December that I kind of glossed over. They added a free safety from Boston College, who I think played a decent amount for them. Um, so kind of excited about that. It looks like. Um, Kobe White or, or Kobe White. It's spelled K-O-B-A-Y. We'll have to double check all these pronunciations. But he's the the Boston College receiver coming in. Played a pretty good amount. It was actually preseason all ACC in 2019 as a redshirt junior. Led the team in catches. Made some really nice plays for them. And he missed the 2020 season with a knee injury. So I think he's coming back off that. But is someone who's super talented and um I think, what is it, Kurt Tignetti's brother, I think, is the offensive coordinator there. So I imagine he got a pretty good intel on on, on the wide receiver's abilities. So he's got over 1,400 career receiving yards in the ACC. Losing well stinks, but you add in a Monmouth transfer who was productive. You add in another transfer who was productive. You got Chris Thornton coming back. I'm not all that worried. I don't think one guy makes a program, but at the same time, we can get into it a little more, but definitely sucks to lose Antoine Wells. Like, he's Played two seasons, and he's one of the best receivers JMU's ever had. Yeah, I mean, you also have the Ra- you have Ravenelli, you have Reggie Brown. You, you, I mean, you still have a really good – with these transfers now, it's even bolstered. It's a good wide receiver room. It's, it's still good. And if they were staying in the FCS, it would probably be a top-tier, you know, wide receiver room in the FCS, but going to the FBS, being in the Sun Belt. I think that's my whole thing with it is I, I completely understand why Antoine Wells wanted to transfer. I mean, he got Miami, Mississippi State. Um, those are just the two that are pumping, like that are in the front of my head. But North so Carolina, many, Auburn. Yep. Okay. Yes. <laughs> like all these huge power, like huge power five brands. Old Dominion. Uh, maybe not as big. Uh, did they really <laughs> offer him? Yeah. What a waste of time. What a waste. Uh, a lot of there are a lot of responses on like the major programs from like their fans and even some JMU fans are like, yeah. And then there was like ODU, and they're like, nah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> ODU, you are the same level as JMU at this moment. Could you imagine <laughs> if he went to ODU? That would be truly shocking. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, and I think that's why I'm bummed, though. Because if, if he had stayed and, and like been a part of the Sun Belt move, right. he would have kept putting up big numbers, maybe a little bit more of national attention. But, I mean, you can't beat Auburn national attention. You can't beat miami national attention especially next year with miami with a new coaching staff and like all the hype around them miami's gonna miami and dominate headlines so i think that's what we should probably get into a little bit too is because i saw a lot of a lot of people asking like why did antoine wells transfer one i don't know like i don't talk to antoine wells so like i don't have any specific information so everything that we're saying is speculation but from like a pure football standpoint if you want to play football and make money playing football there are better schools to do that, whether it's preparing for the NFL or NIL yeah. than JMU. And that doesn't mean that JMU is a bad football school. It doesn't mean he wouldn't have been able to go to the NFL. But, like, they haven't had a receiver drafted since 1997. 
they're not like I don't know, like FCS receivers don't necessarily get a lot of headlines. Cooper Cup had disgusting FCS stats and was like, what was he, like a third-round pick? Yeah. And now he's like one of the best receivers in the NFL. If he was doing similar things at a power five, I don't think he's a third-round guy. He probably goes earlier. So it's, it's I don't know, it's hard to necessarily fault it. Well, you can't fault him for doing it, but I think the thing that was confusing a little bit for some fans is like, oh, we're, we're going to the Sun Belt. So it's going to be a higher level. It's going to be more exposure. And then it's like, well, he's getting offered by North Carolina and Virginia Tech and Auburn and South Carolina. Like as much as you think. State and like brands. As as much as you think JMU could like hang in a game with South Carolina or North Carolina or whatever, that's not the same thing as playing ACC competition and putting 12 games of ACC games on film as it is playing against like old dominion or marshall now that's better than the fcs but like if you're a guy who's good enough to play in the power five it's easy to understand why he would want to do that with so much eligibility left it's also something where like i don't have inside knowledge here but typically in the portal you can get an idea like people can reach out to you like illegally and you can get an idea of like power fives wanting you my guess is that there was potentially some contact or at least an idea and like i think antoine wells knew not just from like a gut feeling that power fives would offer him. And that, that bared itself out within 45 minutes. He's posted 15 different graphics. of the right. <laughs> And you brought it up too. Cooper cup is a great example. He gets drafted in the third round, but if he's doing that against power five schools, people always argue the NFL will find you one. That's not entirely true. Um, they're not always going to find you. And two, would you rather be a third round pick? And we're talking about guaranteed money now and the contracts that come with it. Would you rather be a third round pick who had to scratch and claw to be that or play in a power five? And even if the NFL is going to find you regardless, if you're a first round pick, you have five years, four years with a, if you, if you're productive, a fifth year and a lot of money guaranteed. And the difference between even the second pick in the first round and the 22nd pick in the first round is millions of dollars. So to stick around at JMU, I think it's a smart move by Wells to go to the power five because you could catapult yourself up from a, because he probably is going to be drafted. If he continued this trajectory, he was going to be drafted, but he would have been drafted in the fourth, fifth, maybe third round at the highest. If he continues this trajectory to power five, he's a second or a first round pick putting millions and millions and millions of dollars more in his pocket. And I saw some people that were like, you know, it might not work out. Like it might not work out at a power five. He might not have the same stats. He doesn't need the same stats. He just needs a certain level of like eyeballs on him from scouts and and media and all that good stuff. Because you look at some JMU players like Jimmy Moreland had unbelievable stats for defensive back at JMU. He's a late seventh round pick after balling out in like one first exhibition. And then I think got him into the senior bowl and he killed it at the senior bowl. He was like battling with Hunter Renfro on a daily basis. Then he's a seventh round pick balls out in preseason and camp just to like scrap his way onto the 53 man and be like a nickelback. Yeah. Like that, that took a lot of effort and success just to even get to that point. And the same thing with like Antoine Wells, like, yeah, it might not work out at a power five, but what if he does go and ball out the way he thinks he can? And if he doesn't, then would he have actually been an NFL player? You know what I mean? Like if you can't ball out at a P five or at least put up decent stats, then maybe like some of the JMU hype was the level you were playing at. Maybe he wasn't an NFL guy. So like you could learn that now instead of <laughs> four yeah. years from now. So I think that's the other thing too, is he could learn with so much eligibility left. You can be like, Oh, I need to work on this in the off season and that'll help me get to the NFL where if he's playing some of the defense he's currently going up against, he might just embarrass them and be like, Oh, you know, here's my ability or whatever and all that good stuff. And, and yeah, but I, I don't know. I just I think it it makes a ton of sense for him. I think most JMU fans are kind of celebrating what he did at JMU and they're just sad that he's leaving, which I think is the right reaction is definitely be like, you know what, go get yours. But I also think some fans were like, I'm not sure it's going to work out. Well, it might, but it's also like his own choice to go and see if it does work out. Like I wouldn't really question him leaving. And and some of the other takes, this is kind of my final point on Wells. There are some takes that like, why would he go to ODU? It's a lateral move. I don't think he's going to ODU. Like if he commits to ODU, then say that. But him posting that he has an offer from them is probably because he's like 19 or 20 and really, really excited that he's gotten like 
15 cool offers in an hour of entering the portal. I think that's way more what it's about. And he's also gaining a bunch of like interest from fans and things and gaining a bunch of Twitter followers by posting all these various offers. Like he's not going to ODU would be my guess, but I think a lot of why he's posting them is because he's excited about the offers and he'll probably end up picking one of the like good power five schools. You know, it would really hurt. If he ended I think, up going, I think Tex legit player. No, that's I don't even think that would hurt that much. I think Coastal or ECU would be so painful. I don't think those are like they're not in play at all. I don't really in play is my I, I, personally. I think it's Auburn. I don't know the kid at all, like at all. <laughs> but like just the name, the like going to the SEC and balling out in the SEC is different. Or Miami because Miami's such a brand and like there's so much hype around them right now. I think even Carolina and Tech both have like need at receiver and he could really like stand out as an ACC guy. So I think those are, but I think for, I would be shocked if he didn't pick a power five is what I'll say. Like I saw people seeing East Carolina, ODU and coastal. And like you were saying where it's like, Oh, that'll sting. And like, I think he's aware that that might not yeah, be really that's... even step up from where he is. Yeah. If you, if you're going, that's a complete lateral move. I will say this too. Someone's uh, got to really get in these transfers um, ears and tell them not to just screenshot logos off of Google. Why are they, are they old? No, they just all have the X and then the three dots. And then the, like, <laughs> the, the, it's just clearly a screenshot, like from Google, like he went to, he Googled. Oh, South oh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it now. Yeah. I got he Googled you. South Carolina's logo and screenshot the PNG. So it has the checkered background. Uh, whatever. That's a, that's a me thing. That's that's no one else. Good for him. I think it's great that Wells is is going to have the opportunity <laughs> at the Power Five level, assuming Power Five level. And uh, I think I think he'll still put up stats. He won't put up gaudy stats like he was doing. He probably won't dominate the competition as well as he was at the JMU FCS level and probably what he would have done at the Sun Belt level. But this is the this is the step he needs to take to to be able to go on and become a star in the NFL. If that's his if if and most likely is his end goal. Right. Yeah. I mean, chance to make NIL money, chance to make NFL money makes a ton of sense for him. The other thing that I thought was hilarious, just from like looking at each school is like, you'd post the offer and you see like Virginia tech got over like a thousand likes. You got Virginia tech players are hype about this. Got all these fans going crazy. And then he was like UNLV and it just got like 70 likes like UNLV, like just flat out doesn't have fans. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I thought those were, were fun to see how like the power fives reacted. And then you also had like uh, ODU who had like two people being like, hooray. <laughs> <laughs> what were they like? Sorry. One more time. Hooray. <laughs> but the ODU had like five, had like five or six comments and four of them are Jamie fans that are like, no. And then one, <laughs> When is like an old Dominion person being like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I thought those were hilarious. Interested to see where he picks. I think he'll be a fun guy to, to follow. And yeah, I mean, I don't think Jamie's receiver room is like screwed. They just added two transfers who are going to contribute. They just added a transfer quarterback who I think will be good. The running back room stacked, assuming they can stay healthy. Young offensive line got a ton of experience. Like I feel very good about the offense, even with Wells transferring. And I will say Jamie fans, Get ready for a four or five loss schedule next year. Yeah, if they play the full Sun Belt, they're going to take some losses. They're going to take a lot of losses and probably games that you're going to be upset at Signetti. They also might win out. Head. You know, that is a possibility. There's a lot of possibilities in the world, um, and that is one of them. I don't think that one's the one I'm putting my money on, though. I bet they'd have a winning record, though. Okay. I think. I'll have to see the schedule first and then I'll, I'll do the cop out. I'll look at the schedule. Well, we should have like a live reaction to the full schedule and go play by do a Twitter space. We should do a Twitter space every time they had a transfer. <laughs> no, <laughs> it will be like this guy just like pulling up his bio. This guy had some, which is what I did in the podcast with the wide receiver from Austin college. But that's what I did with Todd, Todd Centeno. And uh, I like him though. I think I am excited it. for him. I will say, I think I'm, I keep forgetting they added him. Like I'll keep bringing up Billy Atkins. Like he's the starter. And every time either you or Dom or someone's like, they added the Colorado state kid. And I'm, I am very excited for him. I think he's going to be really good. And I think, like you said, what Sinceri's done with Danucci, what he did with Cole, there's a lot of talent there with this Colorado state transfer, a lot of talent. I think he's a little bit more raw and I didn't expect Colorado State's coach to be catching strays on this podcast, 
I don't think uh, Steve Adazio is a good coach. I don't like, I'm not trying to. I'm didn't. really, I'm, I'm not trying Steve Adazio. I'm sorry if you're listening. Um, I do not mean for you to be catching strays from Bennett like this. <laughs> I don't think I'm wrong, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I, like they fired him. So. <laughs> okay. But, but what I'm saying is I think coming into it. Yeah. Coaches. He only like, had two seasons and then he got canned. I don't, I, what I'm saying is like, I think for him to have like, sucks. Success, you think he doesn't deserve to be anywhere near a football field. Yes. But I think like for him to have the stats that he had and also have been good at temple, like he had, he's had success yeah. despite like these like mediocre coaching stats where I think he's going to a really good one with some really good offensive yeah. minds and good skill players and a good, like, I think the sky's the limit for him. I think he made a good transfer decision and I'm excited to have a guy um, not that Cole Johnson like couldn't move, but I think uh, Santeo is a little bit shiftier side to side, which I think will the lateral movement, I think will be fun to watch. Yeah. Great point. Um, anything else you want to add on football, anything else on the transfers, anything like that, or do you want to jump? I mean, there's not really much to talk about in the basketball world either. So this might just be the wrap of the podcast. There's not a ton. I guess we can do a, a quick little basketball thing, but I'm excited for the football team and uh, hopefully they do hit us with that like confirmation that they're going to play some belt teams next year soon. Um, I think that'll make everyone really excited. And um, I'm bummed they're not playing in the national title, but it is what it is. Are you going to tune into the national title? I actually think I might watch. Yeah. I'm probably going to watch a little bit of it too. Um. JMU is supposed to play in men's basketball on Sunday against Hofstra. We'll see if that happens. They haven't played since December 11th against Radford. They've had games against Morgan State and Penn canceled. And then they had a large portion of their beginning CAA schedule get rescheduled and postponed. This is crazy, Jack. They've only played the one game since we were there and stormed the court for the Virginia win. Doesn't that feel like forever ago? What it was a, a month ago tomorrow was when we're, we're recording on January 6th. What's insane is all the life events that have happened for me. That sounds selfish for me, it only matters about what's happened in my life. We've um, both gotten married, we've both gotten divorced. During we've this also had four kids each now. <laughs> it's been a long time since they played. No, but I've moved from Virginia to Charlotte, um, mm-hmm. decorated everything. You've found a new apartment. Like everything yeah. like, a lot's <laughs> happened a lot since of... December 7th. A lot has happened. They still only have the Radford win, which was a, a nice come from behind win. I wanted them to play the Penn game really bad because I think it was at the Palestra, which is just a really cool venue in the, the Philly area. So that would have been fun, but it didn't happen. Hofstra's a darn good team. It's unclear if JMU is going to have a full roster if they're able to play on Sunday. I don't think the CAA, I could be wrong, I don't know that they adopted the CDC's like five day instead of 10 day, like uh, isolation quarantine kind of stuff, which is hilarious and classic if they, if they have not yet done it. I know they named like, you have to have at least like seven guys and a coach or something, which other leagues have done, but I I hadn't seen if they actually did the, the five day, but I'm guessing they hadn't right. Otherwise they would probably (laughs) be able to have their full roster on the night, but who knows? I don't know. Hopefully they can get going and and get things going. The good news is if you get it and then you recover, you get, well, when you recover, I shouldn't say if you recover, that's, I think they're all going to be okay from every report there. No one's dying from this. So on the team, (laughs) this is really (laughs) spiraling. (laughs) But all I'm saying is like everyone on the team seems like they have mild to moderate symptoms. So, or whoever got it right on the team have mild to moderate symptoms. So you recover. And then the guidelines are that you get 90 days where you don't have to get tested, I believe, because you're considered to have immunity for at least those 90 days. So that would give you a couple months. So then you would assume that they'd be able to make it through the rest of the season, essentially January, February, March, um, without having those guys even like have to be tested. So I do think like this might be their, their one and only kind of like little pause thing. Um, in terms of internal issues, obviously yeah, they, can, say, they can very okay. much run into problems. Could definitely be other teams, but the good news is they'd still be able to practice and maybe even schedule some fun stuff. Like you look at uh, San Francisco, some of their opponents had a bunch of COVID stuff. So they decided to schedule Loyola Chicago for a really fun game that was played today in 
uh, Salt Lake City, I think, just like two o'clock in the afternoon with a stream that like barely worked. Yep. Um, Loyola Chicago picked up the dub in that one. But, like maybe they'll find and a way covered. to and cover. I should have played that. But um, they're, um, yeah, I don't know. It could lead to maybe some fun scheduling stuff if other games get canned and, and you're able to play. So that is the positive. I didn't mean to go on a weird COVID thing about how like it doesn't kill people. But, <laughs> but um, I think everyone on the team is healthy was really my point. And I think it will probably be the last GMU issue for the year, even though opponents might have it. It took a really long time to get there, but I'm glad we got there. But I got there. <laughs> and uh, I hope they can play the next two. Hofstra, Northeastern, both those are really exciting to me. Home games, too. Um, I'm also really looking forward to, apparently, William & Mary's good now. They're weird, man, because they suck, but, like, they got a couple conference wins, right? They uh, they started 0-12 against Division One opponents. <laughs> they are 2-0 and in conference with not just, like, wins against bottom feeders. Wins against two wins in conference by a combined two points. They beat Hofstra 63-62, and they beat Northeastern 71-70 by any means necessary. One thing that does make me sad is every team in the league has played a conference game except JMU. That is very sad. All right. Anything on women's basketball? I believe they play Sunday if everything goes to plan. I think they got a Friday one first, unless that also got canned. No, they have Friday against William & Mary and then so Sunday. Friday, Friday, yeah, they got Friday, Sunday. They're also coming out of a COVID buzz. The one thing that I think is worth noting – uh, I saw a Shane Metlin tweet the other day that Peyton McDaniel is closer to redshirting than she is to returning, which does not seem like a great sign. So, um, what so monitor because we've kind of been banking on the fact that the offense would get better when she returned. Uh, I, I like the way they played in their final game before this little pause they've had, but we'll see what happens. I think they got a chance to be really competitive in conference and God, I hope these, these games happen for both teams here. Because it can get kind of dull from a college sports perspective, especially JMU in January and February if the basketball teams are not playing. Like there's then there's essentially nothing happening that you can watch. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> and I think there's uh, a lot swim, for us to talk about <laughs> swim and dive is also in a pause. Or are they has, really? They've had some postponements. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Get boosted, everybody. Stay safe out there. All right. Not to make this political. Bennett's going off. The, <laughs> Bennett's just taking over as I'm trying to find. Oh, my God. Well, anything else you need to add that isn't COVID related or preachy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I have too much. I guess we'll kind of play it by ear in terms of weekly podcasts, depending on, like, how much the teams are actually able to play. Yeah. That'll be a pretty – a pretty big factor there. And uh, I've seen some people clamoring for some baseball content. We will slowly move into baseball, softball, lacrosse, I think yeah. maybe tennis and golf. They got a chance for some really good spring sports season. So we'll get to that probably end of January, early February. Yeah, Ben has been wanting to talk to the golf coaches, uh, probably some tennis coach talk, but maybe try and swing some of the coaches on to talk to them. I think that'd be really exciting if we're given that access um and yeah i think it i think maybe even next week we should probably talk chase the lauder because he's one of the top prospects in the nation in college so huge stuff and uh jmu's gonna come back and no, i'm not gonna make fun of baseball i'm so sorry not, not like yet to, i'd like to have sigmetti on to answer to the fake punt fiasco that's a very good playing. point well for Bennett Conlin, my name's Jack Fitzpatrick. Thank you guys for tuning in to the JMU Sports News Podcast. I'm going to stop Bennett before he gets a little bit too more <laughs> preachy. Sport, JMU Sports News Podcast is presented by Bet Online. You guys have a wonderful rest of your day. See ya. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.